um, welcome to this uh, episode of Internet of Senses for uh, the Sense of Smell. Um, my name is Sophia Eric, and I am an art historian, academic researcher, and curator of multisensory experiences. And right now, my main work is with the European-funded project Odoropa, which advocates for smells and smelling as an important part of Europe's cultural heritage. And today, I have uh, Marie Clapeau with me. I'm very excited to interview. And uh, Marie is an educator, sensory museologist, and disability justice advocate. Uh, she consults with schools, museums, and other organizations on accessibility and inclusive practices. Currently, she is the Associate Museum Educator for Accessibility at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, where she crafts sensory-based programming, including all factory events for disabled and non-disabled visitors, and implements museum-wide strategies to embed olfactory practices in interpretation. She has published multiple articles on using sensory museum practices uh, for accessibility. Very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so welcome, Marie. Thank you for being here today. Of course, my pleasure. Um, so uh, today we will talk about um, other, other abilities in the museum, smell as a tool of accessibility in the museum, and challenges of using smell, actually. So we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit about using smell in the museum as well as a um, storytelling technique. So I'm very excited to have you as our guest today. Uh, we not too long ago had Carl Verbeek on the podcast and we discussed a bit about uh, curating with smell in the museum. So I hope that we can continue this conversation a bit today. So let's jump right in. You are the associate, associate Museum Educator for Accessibility at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So can you start by telling us a bit more about your job and what you do there? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, gosh, it's, it's a lot of things. But I think what it means to think of accessibility in the museum context is kind of taking a multi-pronged approach. So oftentimes people will think of either accessibility as specific programs for visitors with disabilities, or maybe people are going to think of the ramp to avoid the stairs, etc. And, and truth is that it's all of that, uh, but also um, taking into account the different aspects of a museum, because accessibility is not just about making your building or your website are your exhibition accessible or having program? It's also thinking uh, about representation of people with disabilities in your collection, in your staff. Um, and it's something that might be a lot specific to the US because of the history of uh, the concept of disability and a legal system that has supported the discrimination um, or helped people uh, fight against discrimination for people with disabilities. Uh, but what it means for, for us in, 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 in my work specifically is that we, we do tailor programming for a variety of audiences and we happen to have um, ongoing programs, scheduled programs on a monthly basis for specific audiences, for people who are blind, for people with dementia and their care partner, autistic people and others and, and deaf people, but it's not, it, it doesn't cover the extent of, of our work. We also have um, many partnerships with organizations who serve uh, people with various disabilities. So it's not just people who are blind. And I think also something that's important to mention is that um, oftentimes people with disabilities don't have only one disability. There can be multiple disabilities. And so we we have also this partnership for for people to enter the, the museum and we also so that's kind of an aspect of, of our work the thing is that those program for us it's it's not a an end in and of itself uh, those what we call access programs in our jargon are more a point of entry to the museum so ultimately our goal in our work is to give a choice for disabled visitors because Truth is that cultural institutions have still a lot of work to do in, in, that, uh, in that field, and um, a lot of them are inaccessible, or, or like st there are still some barriers that people will encounter. So what I mean, what I mean by giving choice is that 
any visitors, disabled visitors, able visitors should be able to say, you know what, there is this program, there is this performance, I want to go there. So we work very closely with our colleagues, not only in the education department, but anyone who does programming, or as I mentioned earlier, our digital team, our exhibition team, to ensure that every aspect of a museum visit um, will be accessible. And that really starts from the from the get go, right? From from people knowing that those programs exist, knowing that the museum is accessible, knowing that the museum is a place for them. Because historically, um, disabled people have been excluded. So it's just like, and we still hear oftentimes people, oh, I didn't know you had touch tours. I didn't know I could come. Um, a colleague of mine uh, in another museum in New York City at, at the Museum of Modern Art, um, they had a wonderful event in March. Uh, they were celebrating their um, um, I think, I can't remember if it was 40 or 50 years of, of their um, tactile tours. And there was a little girl who came, uh, uh, who is blind and, and told them, it's like, it's so cool. I didn't know I had a museum just for myself, uh, just for me. Um, so it, it's quite wonderful when you hear that, but it's also, oh, wow, we're still not, people don't think of us places for them. In our work, it's really important to think like, how, do, how are people going to access that information? How are they going to get to the museum? Um, so we keep all those aspects in, in mind. And, and as I briefly mentioned earlier also, another aspect of, of our work is to think of representation of disabled people. And that and, and it's kind of fostering um, conversation around disability justice in the arts or what, at least in the US, we think of disability justice. And that means for us to question representation of disability in the Met collection, as well as hiring people with disabilities. Um, it's like, and, and we can't think of making a space accessible, physically speaking or technically speaking, without thinking of um, you know, this community, this community seeing themselves in that space. So it's it's actually a very important part of our work um, and that I think in some ways many people are starting talking about. Yeah, and that's amazing, like what you said about the young girl being able to see herself as being represented in in like a communal space. I mean, museums are for the community and made for the community. So it's important that you're able to see yourself there or or feel at home there and that's something that i think uh these multi-sensory approaches can really offer people is is this way of engaging in ways that are more accessible for for everyone because i was just at a museum with a group of of women i was in in germany and they all like a bunch of them just said i don't like museums very much mm -hmm. i just can't it's not a place where I like to go and it's, I, I just stand there and look at things and uh, it's not so, it's not my favorite place <laughs> to be. And I think it's very much because the museum can be a bit intimidating and uh, doesn't have, it doesn't always have this very engaging aspect. And so um, it's nice when you can kind of get in there and, and touch things and smell things and, um, it really offers a nice approach to the museum. But I wanted to ask you, uh, what's an example of, as you said that you often, um, that you're at the Met trying to uh, showcase people with disabilities mm -hmm. in the, in, within the art. Uh, can you give an example of, of that? Yeah, so so I think what I meant, what I meant, I mean, it's first in our staff we have, and myself, I have a disability. A lot of um, people who work on our team um, have a disability, and people who who teach our program, uh, the access programs, also have disabilities, and we really encourage our staff also to. Um, um, our you know in our hiring practices, we really are. Um, um, building a process where people with disabilities um, can feel that they can apply and that there are accommodations so that they can go through the uh, um, application process. But in terms of the collection, what it means is that, um, so the concept of disabilities hasn't existed for, for that long. Uh, but if you look at works from, from the Renaissance or even before, I am sure, and it's, it's actually an interesting example, but there are many representation of the miracles of that Christ um, accomplished, Christ healing the lame, Christ healing the blind, and those representations have been um, have been kind of um, um, used across across centuries, um, and 
or there can be also, um, I'm thinking of blind Homer, or in ancient Egypt and ancient Greece, there are actually a, a, a really impressive number of dwarfs. Um, they were actually, you know, part of the courts used often as um, entertainment. Um, in some ways, they were kind of a, a bouffon of, of a court. But there are also examples of a scribe in ancient Egypt who, who was a dwarf then we can think also so it's speaking of representation of disabilities in works of art and then also of artists um, who had disabilities you know one that gonna might come to people and that might be controversial is van gogh who had mental illness and and others that might be actually um less known i mean of course monet is another one he had a visual impairment and another one that may be less known is actually camille pissarro so it's really interesting with him because he when all the impressionist painter were going to outside of Paris and, and paint in plein air. He stayed in the city. And the reason why he stayed in the city and that we have us now so kind of famous um, bird eye view of a city, um, um, it's because he had a vision impairment. Actually, light was really impacting um, his vision. So he was painting from his uh, apartment. So it's interesting to think here of how disability was in many ways a creative force. Uh, for the artist. And so we we are, I think it's important because the narratives in art historic, in an art historical context are um, actually um, that we engage with them. Because what happens when so many images of people with disabilities are um, put in front of people's eyes and not questions, we take them for what they are. And I could have a more a uh, nuanced conversation about Christ healing the blind. And I understand that there is a, a religious metaphor and um, um, a need for making faith tangible. But truth is that oftentimes we have a blind person who is kneeling down, so it, who is at a lower position than Christ. And, and oftentimes people with disabilities have seen, are seen as having a lack, a lack of something. And, and that stays across the edges, that's a stereotype that still happens. So it's also a way to challenge that, how people of uh, challenging um, how people with disabilities are viewed. So yeah, we've been we've been working with over educators, curators, disabled artists, um, disability study scholars um, to really think of how can we have those narratives being uplifted or engaged with at least and and for some we don't have like specific solution but i think it's just important to uh, making it making it part of a public conversation yeah it's very very important and also very uh interesting perspective to to take and to yeah, very important perspective as well. To move on a little bit, you've answered the question, uh, this question uh, kind of, but what are the different audiences and different situations that you are considering when you're curating your programs? Yeah, 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 indeed. I think I partially responded um, to it in the sense that it's thinking of accessibility as multi-pronged. Uh, it's not just having access program. It's not just having multi-sensory strategy. Uh, it's really thinking of the whole experience that the person are, are going to have from the time of, you know, looking for the program online or um, I think there are still print materials um, despite the pandemic, but how are they going to get access to to knowing about the, the program and then how are they going to get there? Um, and so we we work with our digital department to make sure that the the website is is accessible, and and that goes in making a program successful, right? Because one of the thing is that um, it can be difficult to, uh, difficult for um, someone to navigate a new space to get to a new space. You know, thinking of New York City, there are a lot of subway stations that are accessible, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. um, just an example to say that you know we sometimes take for granted to just say oh, I'm going to go there and you're there in your 30 minutes, et cetera. For someone with disabilities, it might take much more planning and that impacts how uh, you arrive at the museum. And we want people to arrive at the museum, be relaxed and, and feel like they can enjoy what they're gonna, they're gonna see. Um, similarly, the, the Met is a big place. So thinking uh, when we create program, we think of um, you know, their experience at the museum. And what that might entail is, is thinking of way of, of wayfinding, right? Um, something that's really in, in our minds and, and what are ways we can help people navigate the museum more easily. In terms of programs, 
and you you ask i think also like what are audiences that we serve so really we uh, we want to serve everyone and 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 also you know the the programs are tailored for people with disabilities uh, through different strategies but it is using sensory engagement um, we also offer access accommodations so it can be for someone who might have a chronic illness and may not use a, a wheelchair but sometimes does get tired and need to to sit regularly unfortunately although it's something that we're working on uh, museums don't have that many benches sometimes so we offer a stool, for example, for someone to have it and sit whenever they want, or they can also borrow a wheelchair. So it's just those, um, those access accommodation also can be uh, in the form of assisted listening devices. So, you know, the, some people might be hard of hearing because of disabilities, because hearing also um, decreases with age oftentimes. So we have those devices where, you know, the, our, the, the, the guide will speak in a mic and people will have headphones. So that helps make the, the experience a little, a little better. So, yeah, and, and it's really thinking, thinking about all those details and, and thinking through what are the barriers that someone with the disability will encounter. So in that sense, also really important to work with, with, the disability community to better understand their needs, better understand their interest. And so that's why I mentioned earlier also that we have partnership because it's a way to work directly with, with the community. Did I answer did I answer the question? I feel like yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, you did. Do you think that normally or in general that many museums uh serve different audiences well or do you think they could improve uh on this a bit? Yeah, so that, that's a good question, and 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 to be fair, I think there there is a lot of good work done, and um, in in many museums, um, I myself ended up coming to the U.S. because in the early two thousand, when I got interested in that field, um, Europe, except the U.K., didn't have that much, and and um, when I try, I had had the chance to do an internship in the U.S. and and fell into the field, and was this is what I want to do. There was no training, no courses, university. And um, so I came to the US pretty much to learn from people here. But now that has changed drastically. Like you, now many, many uh, European countries have, have program, et cetera. So that to say that I think so many museums are doing good work. Um, I would say that some of the things that are missing is still from museums to think of accessibility from the get-go. Get Oftentimes, what has happened, what we see happen is that someone is going to come up with the idea of an exhibition um, and will be, you know, two months from the exhibition opening, and I'm giving an example. It's not a, necessarily a real-life example. But all of, us, all of a sudden, they'll say, oh, are the labels legible to people are blind? Are they, is it the print? It becomes an afterthought instead of being used as an opportunity for creativity. And, and for thinking like, how can we make actually an exhibition space, a program um, fully inclusive of, you know, the, the wide variety of bodies and minds that exist in this world? Because oftentimes, and is when we serve people with disabilities, we also end up actually making it accessible to, to other people who maybe, you know, who don't have a disability. I'm thinking, you know, even kids, oftentimes the artworks are so high up um, or you you can't reach for for something and and so or you know we were talking uh, we were talking with some 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 people also it's just making a, a stair free environment how it serves also so many people um, because of people also we age but also we don't all have the same type of body and and we don't have the same stamina um, there are people who carry things. I often give the example of like, imagine in, the, in an airport, if you had um, stairs to go everywhere, people would be exhausted pu pulling their, their, their suitcases everywhere. And no, it's, it's all, it's accessible. So yeah, yeah it's, I think it's just, and I think the other um, thing to think of where in some ways museums are lacking is what we were talking about earlier. It's like really thinking of um, accessibility, not only in terms of, physical access or programming, but thinking of how a real accessible space is when the community is also represented in that space. So having disabled people in your staff, uh, and not just, I think it's also important to recognize that it's not just for show, that they are like 
but disabled people should be position of leadership also because mm -hmm. their way of viewing the world of, of viewing the museum will impact what what happens and then engaging with representation of disability in in collection i think is also really crucial yeah i was thinking about what you said um with uh accessibility being an, a sort of afterthought and this is something that's also interesting in terms of smell because smell in the museum sometimes it's like, okay, we've done this whole exhibition. Oh, but it would be great to have a smell. Let's have one. And it's really important with these types of curation that you really have to think about it from the beginning. And it has to be this meaningful uh, part of the storytelling. And I just really thought of that when you, when you said that about um, accessibility as well, that, okay, we need to shape these exhibitions not just for uh, yeah we we place everything on the walls but then also going through the space um, how how are people going to go through that space is it able for um, someone in a wheelchair is it able for for a small child or these kinds of things are important to think about when you're when you're curating a an exhibition or, or exactly. an event of any sort um, and it's the same things with uh, that happens with smell as well. Um, and I was thinking about that also with museums, um, oftentimes there are limited resources. So that's another thing that you're adding when you have smell, you have this added medium, you could say. Mm -hmm. So that's also like at the Met, you, you're able to provide your visitors with wheelchairs or, or these special devices to help them go through the space, but maybe a smaller museum might not be able to provide these resources. So it's another interesting uh, dynamic to think about. Yeah, I mean, resources are, are crucial and, and resources and you were, I think also something that um, it makes me think of is that in terms of ascent, right, or even accessibility is making sure that, but I think there is more collaboration across a museum. You know, I think we we have so many professions that can be represented in, in a museum. You, you'll have, I mean, especially I, I should talk of, you know, the Met, we have like curators who are um, designing the, the, you know, the, the content of the exhibitions. Uh, we have exhibition designer and we have, um, you know, educators. And I think it depends also who hold uh, what knowledge. But I think if there was more uh, collaboration on even between creators and educa educators in thinking of the exhibitions um, and also thinking together about the programming, right, how that could actually enrich uh, the type of interpretation, but also the exhibition maybe itself, right, thinking, because ultimately those exhibitions are designed for audiences. And so it's how can we make those more, more inclusive. But um, yeah, it's, it's a good point, I think, for Scent, it's 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 very true, it, it becomes an afterthought, an afterthought. Yeah, so how, how have you combined forces of uh, making the museum more accessible and also using smell as a medium for uh, curation? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I came to, to scent, um, I joke sometimes with people because I'm French, so people just assume, but I'm into perfume, etc. It's actually really not how it, how it happened. I, I came to scent and I think it's, it's worth the, the um, going back in time because I was just talking actually to the person who introduced me to to that field Eliza Douglas who is a, a perfumer she lives in the UK because so much of the lesson that I've learned early on I've stayed with me and so that is uh, before I came to the Met I was working for a small non-profit um, called Art Beyond Sight and I was specifically working for their lab for learning we were teaching in schools teaching social, social skills through the arts to kids with disabilities and so what that means it might be um, teaching young disabled kids like how to tie your shoes, um, can be using music to do that, movement, etc. And we got to a point where we felt that there was a gap in in in, in self presentation and grooming, and so we thought, why not talk about about you know hygiene and and how do you select products for yourself? You know, even shampoo, soap, uh, perfume, lip balm. How do you kind of you know take care of your public uh, appearance? And you know for Kids who are blind, when oftentimes like parents will do everything for them, mm -hmm. um, they they buy all the things. They don't get to choose things that smell good for them. So anyhow, we collaborated with um, Eliza Douglas to uh, develop a curriculum, and 
what was amazing is that I had worked with some of us of us students for for quite a few years, and and you know of course kids it varies in participation. There are things that are more interesting, but what happened with um, using um, raw materials, introducing them to say, well, your soap is made with I don't know red lavender, etc., and it's how it looks like, it's how it smells. It was incredible to see how sent kind of rug down barriers of participation. I'm gonna say because the kids got so chatty. Of course, we know that you know your sense of smell is connected to your limbic system, emotion, memories. But it was kind of really beautiful to see um, students so freely share their insight into into a scent and like memories that would come back and just really be engaged with the, the medium. And soon after after that work, I came to the Met, and because we use multisensory. Um, approaches to, to learning in the museum setting and especially with visitors with disabilities, I kind of was thinking a lot about the role of scent. And, you know, I think truth is that there's been people who's, who've done it um, prior. Uh, there just hadn't been anything kind of um, formalized, especially for educators, like how do you use scent as a, as a teaching tool? in the galleries. So that's kind of how I got, I've started thinking about that um, now many years ago. And, and the same way we use um, sensory engagement with visitors with disabilities, you know, it's really thinking of how, and, and I think you, you were saying that, Sophia, it's how can you be uh, relevant, relevant to your audience, relevant to the object. Yeah, so so from from there, um, it was really thinking, you know, I, of course, uncovered also the, the, the olfactory narrative around objects, right? It's true that um, olfaction can be inherent to an object, an, ob an obvious example can be an incense burner, there was obviously, you know, it's not kind of enshrined on a pedestal in a museum. You can be looking at it, and yes, there are definitely visual visual aesthetics. But truth, we have this beautiful example at the Met of a um, Islamic, a giant Islamic burner in the shape of a, of a lion. It, it was usually put in a in a you know in a home of, of someone of a higher status to 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 scent the guest as they were entering and and what's beautiful is that you have this open metal work like was all fla um, floral design etc so you imagine like the, the smoke that would actually escape from that and so when someone comes to the museum you're missing all of that I mean you're missing also the scent and 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 what what that object was supposed to be doing and so I think it's important when we're talking about um, objects that have been taken away from their culture from their function to to really introduce visitors to that yes I, it's it was learning about kind of and, and thanks to you mentioned uh, carol very big earlier uh, thanks to people like her and other historians and other olfactory art historian like jim drobnik who had done so much work that i was able to educate myself about some of those uh, olfactory narrative so yeah and, and but then i think also there is also thinking of a scent as a way to introduce materials you know for if we a lot of things cannot be touched in museum, but we're talking about objects that might be made of different type of wood. And, you know, sometimes it gets a little bit, we just think of it, oh, it's wood. But things, um, there are some that are made out of sandalwood. And and when someone smells sandalwood, it has such a, you know, an amazing, warm, creamy smell. And there are things that are made of cedar. It's just a way to introduce aspect of a work of art that are, if not, you know, kind of intangible to visitors because things cannot be touched or, or because those stories are not, are not visible to, to the visitor in the scholarship. Yeah. And can you give an example of uh, some, like a project you've done or uh, something where, that you've reanimated maybe with smell in the museum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we have several. So we haven't, um, as uh, from my perspective, I've never quite been uh, had those insertions that you can see in, in some museum where, um, but like the Rubin Museum, for example, in New York City, had a work with uh, Christophe Le Domiel, um on their uh, Mandala Lab, where you have actually like a, a beautiful delivery method to experience different scent that uh, the perfumer created with the, the artist. Uh, oftentimes, I worked as an educator. I I, uh, I use simple sand strip blotters. So I that we and and then we created experiences in the galleries, um, both for visitors who are blind or partially sighted or um, people with dementia, for example. 
one example that I can give is actually at the at the at the very beginning of doing that um, uh, experimentation with smell, uh, we we had a festival that's called Museum Mile. So the Metropolitan Museum of Art is on uh, Fifth Avenue, um, and there are quite a few other major museums um, that are within a mile distance. There is the uh, Guggenheim, uh, MoMA, and others, and Jewish uh, Museum that are there. And so all those museums come, come together in June and have this festival where the museums are open for free to the public. And for the occasion, we had I had designed three different cards connected to an object in the Met collection. One was the medieval all. Um, so you've been to the Met and I don't know it's, if, if you can uh, picture the space, but it's a pretty much a recreation of a, of a, of a cathedral, uh, if, if you will, from, from Europe. And so I had put the, the, the smell of frankincense for this one, just thinking of incense that was burned in, the, uh, in, in churches. And then I also um, created a scent for uh, a sculpture by Piero Bernini. Uh, it's called Spring in Giza Flora. And so I had kind of looked at the, 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 the statue. It's a, it's a white marble statue that's kind of echoing the, its O-tone uh, version of it. And it has a flower garland on its head and, and carries a basket of flowers. So I was kind of thinking of like in Italy at that time, what type of flowers did you find and try to create a scent around that. And we had cards um, that people could pick up and we would give them the scent uh, that they will choose. And on the card, we were encouraging, encouraging them to go to the work of art with a scent strip and smell and think of describing the work of art from that scent experience. Because I think that's one of the, of the powerful full thing with scent is that it kind of, it slows you down, slow you down when, you, when you're looking, when you're engaging with a, a work of art, which I was just talking to a colleague who um, was kind of studying the, the movement of, of uh, visitors in the museum, like, people don't spend more than like 20 seconds in front of a work of art. It's known by museum professional. Like how, how do we change that, right? Because it takes time to explore a, a work of art and scent kind of does that. It slows you down because you have to um, use a sense that you're not used to, um, to using. And it also demands a lot of focus. So yeah, we ask people to do that. And what was what is neat with that then is that we were really touching on an intergenerational audience. Um, so I remember one of the response by a, a, a little girl, she had drew a bubble bath. Uh, that was her description of like looking at the work of art and, and smelling the, the scent. A bubble so that, bath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a bath, she had a, a bathtub with like some bubbles spilling out. So that's what also is interesting is like you can use scent actually as a as a creative prompt, right? People might write, but maybe you want to draw, maybe sort of scents evoke different uh, mark making for people. So, oh yeah, that's an example of how we, one event that we, we did. I want to repeat something that you said. It's just smell slows you down. I just love that. <laughs> It does. It really does. It does. And, and especially when you encourage visitors, I often, you know, start any olfactory experience with, uh, we can call it a meditation or kind of a mind, uh, mindful exercise where, you know, people come from different places, we bring different energy and using senses over than sight demands kind of a, uh, an intention. And so oftentimes I start with a, a, a little meditation just for people to get into their body and just be aware of their senses o over than vision, right? Vision is so fast. It's like you look at something, you think you've seen it, et cetera, which is also not true, right? Um, but, um, and um, I encourage people to also try to not identify the scent, but rather be curious about it. It's daunting. It's a bit like talking about wine, right? People should think that you know, you should know, you should use this word to describe this, etc. Truth is that we all have different tastes, and we all also have our our sense of smell is both personal, cultural. I mean, it's impacting with what we associate. There is no wrong answer that people are gonna give. So if you relax people into that experience and really have them be curious about what they are smelling. Um, sharing things, uh, example of memories or emotions that might come up for them, you really come with really interesting responses and a way to shape a collective conversation around the work of art, which I, I found especially effective with scent. Yeah, and also uh, since I started working with Carl Ferbeek, who we've talked a few times about in this podcast and we had as guest, she, uh, you know, 
talked to, talks about this term olfactory gaze. So where you actually look at works of art for, for their relation to smell. And this also slows me down, right? Because it's okay, I'm not physically smelling in the museum space, but I now go into a museum and I look for references to smell or yeah. anywhere. I mean, I was just in Cologne and I was at the Cologne Cathedral and there was this beautiful altarpiece of the mm -hmm. three Marys with the myrrh, the myrrh bearers um, behind Christ and uh, getting ready to uh, anoint his feet with, with the jars. And uh, so there's these references also that you can look for in uh, to smell um, that without physically smelling that slow you down. So I also love this aspect. Yeah. If you really get people to slow down and look for the smells in the works of art, you can also have that. Um, no, that's that's so true. And the way we think about it in our work, we think of it as like cr cross sensory description. So even if sometimes you cannot touch something or smell, like you know, oftentimes people when they look at something, they said, "Oh, I I feel this right." Um, I mean, you can tell sometimes the sight something is smooth or something is rough, etc. But if you really let it impact you, it, like bodily speaking, you can almost feel it, right? And and so same thing with scent, and 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 it's also helpful in and when you're looking at a work of art right I, I mean I was thinking we had a program um, not long ago and we were looking at uh, the oleanders by Van Gogh and it's like you know you can look at those flowers for so long and there is like I mean the, the way Van Gogh work you know there's so much texture in his, in his brush strokes but thinking of those oleanders and just thinking of like how they might have felt and their smell right just bringing that to life can make the looking so much more uh, vivid and, and impactful on people and memorable. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to another uh, topic. So you uh, have talked a lot about the Americans with Disabilities Act in, in your work, and I wanted you to explain a bit about what this is. But what I also think is interesting is at the beginning of the conversation, you talked about how you came to the US um, because we have a more history of supporting people with disabilities. And this is very interesting for me. I mean, I come from the U.S., so I guess I'm, I'm sort of used to it. Mm -hmm. But if you could maybe compare it a little bit with what you experienced in Europe, uh, I would be interested to hear about that as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I, I kind of got interested in, in the field um, around 2004 or five after an experience in San Francisco, an internship at the Fine Arts of um, Museum there. Um, and uh, when I went back to Europe, so I, I have a disability, I'm, I'm legally blind and my dad is blind, my grandma uh, was blind. So it's, I knew of disability and, and in France oftentimes how it's, it's been a project, at least what I was exposed to, it's like, there are services that people and and help from the government that people can get etc uh, but never and I haven't grown up to be fair also going to museums um, uh, because of of my background my class background but um, when I, I I went back from this internship and and talked to my professors about tactile diagrams and multi-sensory strategies etc um, I, I encountered a black a wall, like people just didn't understand, or it's also, it also felt like there was some, they just didn't understand why. Um, and, and because I was also just discovering the field and didn't have uh, the same knowledge that I have now, I, I was just, I just wanted to train myself because I, I remember recalling this memory. Um, so as I mentioned, my dad was blind. And when I was about seven, I remember going to the uh, to Normandy to look at the site of um, D-Day and um, I remember asking my dad to come look at something and him to say no no it's fine I, I know what it is and it's always been interesting to me because when I think thought that of like, experience it was he could not see he didn't come because he could not share that experience with me and and when I go to museum it is actually so important to think of how yes someone can go their own to the museum uh, but also it's a shared experience and as a Kid, I got deprived of that share experience because the museum was inaccessible from to my dad, and so it's been really um, important for for me in my in, in my work. Um, to of course, I had my my personal experience for it, but to also realize that you know there are 
so many other people with disability and each and everyone has a unique experience. And so to, to keep that in mind in design, but um, to answer your question, yeah, the US were very specific and the UK have a little bit of that, but the US I think also have a history of, of um, supporting people with disabilities. There is what was called the, uh, what is called the disability rights movement, uh, which kind of built on the civil rights movement from the 60s, 60s. and in the 70s, there were a lot of uh, activists who fought for specific act like the EDEA Act to be signed, which was providing um, equal access to education for kids with disabilities. One of them and um, sending thoughts to um, Judy Human um, just passed away. She was a, a huge activist. Um, she passed away a, a, a few weeks ago and was, was instrumental to have those uh, low fast. And then came the ADA in, in the 90s, and that was signed by George W. Bush, um, an extensive legal structure that helped uh, prevent discrimination against people with disabilities in different arena, education, employment, transportation. Uh, one thing that I want to mention, this is a law and it is a baseline. When uh, an institution like a museum is going to look at the ADA, it's going to give you measurement for bathroom for doors for heights yeah. for tables etc and it's it's not as much of a human-centered approach and I mm -hmm. think that's something that's really important to keep in mind right it's not about necessarily making it um about the the people and 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 we need to think about universal design and um and inclusion when when we think of of accessibility it's not just the American with Disability Act if not that would be kind of a bare minimum um, yeah. And just for, you know, it's a law and so museum can get sued, but the, the reason to make the art accessible is, is because it's a right and everyone should have it. And uh, in terms of, of smell, how, how do the two interact with each other, yeah. uh, smell and the uh, Americans for Disability Act? Yeah, so it's it's interesting um, because, um, as I say, it's it's a law, so it's there are there are um, it's changing, and and kind of recently um, there was a case where a, a worker won a, a lawsuit towards the employer that uh, would not make her workplace sin free, and so now um, if um, someone let's say I can go to the Met and say I need my workplace to be sin free. So people can use scented soap and things like this because people might have chemical sensitivities or, or else it is something that's covered under the ADA. What it means in terms of creating olfactory experience, so far the law covers workers, not necessarily like visitors, etc. But of course, you know, the museum is about making it for the people, at, at least for me, it's, it's what it is, the experience. So works, working with scent has some safety concern. I mean, for the artwork, for the visitors, yeah. people do have chemical sensitivities. And so we want to be extremely careful in, in how we uh, decide to deliver the scent in the galleries, making sure that there are disclaimers, making sure that we know the ingredients in the scent so that should someone decide to have experience and have some type of reaction or something, we can inform people, you know, what it was made of. They can decide to opt out because they said, you know what? Very frank in sense. I'm actually. It gives me a headache. I can't, um, you know, smell that scent strip or uh, whatsoever. So, I think, it, and and truth also in the galleries, we have staff. We have our security officers who are there, you know, keeping everyone safe in in the galleries. And so, the idea interacts directly with that. But also, I think we're we're trying to prevent also any anything any any bad experience for visitors kind of using the example of the ADA yeah yeah I mean it's it's amazing what smell can do right we it, it can make this communal experience it can make you connect with the artworks in a different way but there's this huge safety safety challenge that kind of looms over this as a curation technique and something that I also struggle with myself and trying to navigate okay smell is an amazing uh, tool but you have all of these things you have to uh, keep in mind also while you're using it and and you always have to um notify people uh, that this is happening because somebody might walk into the gallery also and have an extreme emotional reaction right. 
towards it, uh, towards the smell that you you don't weren't expecting um, yeah. to have. No, exactly. And it can be, I think you and I talked about that. And it, it can be a positive one. It could be a negative one too, right? There are, um, I think that's the thing we've sent. And that, that's something that I love about the medium, but I think is also um, difficult is that also we have memory associated with scent that maybe we're not aware of. And I have kind of two examples, one good and one bad. And I, but I still, I still remember, I don't know if you're familiar with the documentary, uh, The Empire of Scent by Kim and Gui and, and at some point in the documentary, there is this olfactory therapist in France who is working with someone with dementia and she's giving her a strip to smell. And you see the person posing and you start seeing tears, but you can, you can really see that there are tears of joy and you see the olfactory therapist posing and giving her space to have those tears and the person is nonverbal because of the dementia. And the olfactory therapist just... Um, say something very simple it's like it's reminding you of someone you you cared for and the person like cries even more and like I'm almost crying thinking about it because this is exactly why I love working with that scent right it bypasses language um, you can look at people's reaction even without word which is beautiful but it's also it can be you have to be mindful that some people might have really negative experience people who might have PTSD right from from whatever reason and so if as an educator uh, we are not prepared to this type of, of reaction or we're not just sensitive and compassionate towards them that can make you literally de triggering and dysregulating someone which is really you know difficult for someone who has PTSD to to be in that position so you know those might be the extreme cases but I think they're just important to to know and be aware of yeah. Yeah. And it goes back a bit to uh, what you said about when you use, I don't know if this was only when you use smell or if it's just in general that you actually ask people to uh, become a little bit more aware of their of their senses and where they are and in maybe even it just in that day. And you have to make them feel a bit more comfortable because if you hand them a smell, and something happens like an emotional reaction or or they're thinking about something that they haven't thought about in a number of years then they're kind of in this vulnerable position right in this unusual place or this very public space yeah. so to to kind of have that sense of uh i guess you could kind of say hospitality in a way that you are you're welcoming them and you're getting them ready a bit for this and being comfortable uh in that situation yeah, yeah, no, that's such a good point. Yeah. And and the thing is like you I, I had a similar experience and a positive one. I remember I was actually doing a, a training in Graz um to learn more about perfumes and, and um had to work with them. And I remember at some point one of the you know the uh, professor teacher like passed around a strip and it was a perfume and it was a trésor by Lancome. Um and I'm like, I was like, whoa. I know this perfume and not because I had smelled it in store or something. I was like, this is my grandma. And I had, I, I had no idea she wore that perfume and she had passed. And it was just, it was a wonderful way to like uh, brought her back to, to, to memories. Right. But I had no idea I had that in memory. Yeah. Um, so it was just really fascinating um, to, to just experience that myself also. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to uh, conclude. Uh, time goes fast when you're having fun. <laughs> yeah, so I'll ask the last question, which is, uh, it could be in the industry or simply a world where we learn to value our sense of smell more. But I want to know from you, what is the future uh, of s smell industry or using smell as a curational t uh, technique? Oh, wow, that's a, that's a hard one. Um... Well, for one, I think that using using smell in in the museum context is is gonna become much more common at this point. And I think um, um, it has already like even this past five years, um, I would say I've seen the change even within the Met, right? Because of the work of of uh, people who and and the project of Europa, for ex for example, and others. You know, there's the Institute of Art and Olfaction in the U.S. with Saskia with Saul Brown. And others who have been working with museum already, but I think it's really becoming part of a scholarship. 
like I, I now have colleagues who are in, in, in curatorial position, um, you know, talking, oh, we want to do scent because we subject. And I, so I think it's going to really become part of how museums do business. What I hope is that we'll also, uh, we'll also use scent um, very thoughtfully in the museum context to also engage with the difficult conversations. The fact that scent over centuries have been used as a, as a tool for, for control and oppression. Uh, we can think of stasis and, and you know, using the smell of people and, and training dogs to find who they thought, you know, um, was um, was causing troubles, um, but words don't, don't come to me, um, or stereotypes of a Jewish person also, and others, right? And so I think it's important to engage with that, also engage with the industry, the, the perfume industry, the fact that you know, if museums are starting putting scent in, in their galleries, we need to think of how some of the materials are being harvested, how it's impacted and the environment, the communities of other, and to do that as mindful, uh, mindfully and, and, and engage with also pollution, because pollution has a scent. Um, it's not the same scent for everyone. Not everyone is creating a created equal, unfortunately, in, in, in that sense. So, I do hope that we will engage with the medium also that way, not just it's a wonderful experience, it's a way to make things accessible, but it is actually a difficult, difficult conversation to um, to have around it or with it. Yeah, beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> And very important, all, everything that you said. Uh, and I think this interview also really captures how smell can link so many different topics and places. And it's really, uh, really great to talk to you. Oh, good. Sam here. My pleasure. And it was really a, 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 an honor to be, uh, to be doing this. And yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thank you.